Hello and welcome to Agalia Chats. I'm Eric Meyer, a developer advocate at Agalia. And I am Brian Cardell. I'm also a developer advocate at Agalia. And on today's show, um, we invited back a repeat guest, our friend uh, Miriam Suzanne. Hi, it's good to be here. We invited me on to talk about um, custom elements and styling and Shadow DOM. And uh, particularly, there's this uh, thing going on. We've said before that custom elements are sort of like having a moment. We had a show a couple of episodes ago where uh, Eric wrote a, a number of posts and uh, about... Oh. It was really just one post that was incredibly, incredibly long. <laughs> <laughs> but, if you if you mean only those posts, but there were a lot of posts on social media and things like that um, that were going back and forth uh, that were, you know, talking about Eric kind of discovering custom elements and going like, you know, I kind of thought that custom elements involved the Shadow Dom, like that was part of it. And that that sort of prevented you from from trying them out and adopting yeah. them right yeah um which i also got onto and got into in my stupidly long post but yes i that was the perception that i had was that the whole point of web components was like there was a special shadow dom and you you know you did stuff so that you could sort of plug components into a page one time or many times and what you were plugging in was sort of encapsulated in its own little world. And then I sort of realized that no, actually, I mean, you can do that, but you don't have to, you can keep everything in the light Dom and not have to mess with a shadow Dom. Yeah. They're kind of bundled up under this banner uh, with some other things too, but mainly custom elements and shadow Dom mm -hmm. bundled up under this banner of web components. And I, I think they got sort of, mesh together why exactly do you think you might even want shadow dom because like you know garrick said like you kind of don't need it actually for a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> right um, so if you're building like uh you know the kind of components that you're talking about like your website and you're just like boy i just find myself like repeating myself a lot and a lot of these elements are in here for honestly just styling hooks and you know some some minor stuff or i have these couple of like event handlers that i just hook up and i want just an easy way to make sure that they get hooked up regardless of when they're put in or whatever like custom elements you can use the light dom and what you're doing there is a transform right this like old sort of like it's basically what we used to do with jQuery, right? It's just go into the DOM, find this DOM, and turn it into some other DOM. <laughs> um, the trouble yeah. is... Yeah, what were you going to say? No, I was laughing. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is that like this creates a problem where, like, when exactly does that happen? And, mm -hmm. like, how do you manage, like, an active life cycle that you know things could get added later or and everybody's trying to reason about the dom but sort of like nobody can the person authoring the component they can't reason about like the dom once it's been you know created in the page because we don't know what the user put in there <laughs> or what the user might do to it while it's while the program is sort of running and the page author can't know what was being created that's kind of the point so right you know if you get into more complicated use cases and applications and long-lived things that have like lots of script and um you know complex composite things then what you want is the ability to make some abstraction like the video element and then you want to be able to expose parts of it as not their individual dom nodes but like as you know this is the play pause thing and you can style right. that specifically or on yeah. a range slider we've got a track and a thumb exactly that's a much better example thank you mm. and it does seem that the shadow dom is um like off-putting at least right like it's something new and different 
that we don't have experience with that we haven't done before. And it is like, it closes you off from the things of CSS, which is kind of part of the point of it, right? The, um, the shadow right. DOM part, yeah. Or old and different, maybe is the. <laughs> it's it's not particularly new, but it is, it is different from what I'm used to, and uh, I think also the way they get pushed together in our minds, custom elements in Shadow DOM, is that when we think about components in other settings, uh, say JavaScript frameworks, that's what we think of. It involves both a template of some kind that we get to repeat. And then also uh, the, I don't know, behaviors that you might attach to a custom element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're used to thinking of those together. Right. But what we're not used to is that somewhere in there is like an H1. And if I put an H1 in my page, it doesn't affect the stuff in there. And that's like very, it's disorienting in a way, right? Sometimes. Right. Um, yeah, the way that I at least used to, I had, sort of still do, the way that I think of web components with Shadow DOM is that they're kind of like iframes, except they're not iframes, but they act like iframes, at least in the ways that I'm interested in. They act a little bit like iframes in that respect, but they have no kind of script encapsulation. <laughs> so they're <laughs> completely, <laughs> right. they're completely uh, devoid of any of that. Um, I mean, it was discussed whether that should be a thing or not. Um, and in fact, I think that is where things get really interesting is like the history of it. Um, so yeah, we, but you and I always think the history is interesting. <laughs> we do. I don't know. <laughs> Mia, do you also think the history is interesting? I also always think the history is interesting. Yay. We talk about history. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the history of this is, uh, goes back a really, really long time, uh, the Shadow DOM, a Shadow DOM, not this Shadow DOM exactly, was part of XBL. Uh, XBL predates any of this. And I mean, we're talking about like, you know, mid late 2000s. A lot of things in, in Firefox were built with XBL. And it stood for extensible bindings language. And you could build components with it. And it had this concept of Shadow DOM. And so when web components, when this effort was taken up by Google, people were like, there's a bunch of interesting things here, but we don't know what to do with it. And so Google started to get into all these. And the Shadow DOM thing was clear. Like, And in these discussions, people were using these words like encapsulation. And when people were asking questions, they were saying like, okay, but wait, when I make a component, I don't want the outside to mess up my inside sometimes is really important. And another way of looking at that is like, well, wait, I'm on the outside. I don't want you to mess up my stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in this uh, Mache from Apple, who is like the director now of uh, WebKit Engineering, I think is his title. Uh, he responded with this email that's kind of uh, famous now, I guess, that talked about like, we need to agree what we mean by encapsulation because there's at least five different kinds of encapsulation that I can list here. And you're like, we're not all saying the same thing. Mm, um, right. You could think about this as you have a, a tree. The tree is completely, you know, there's no tree in your computer. It's pointers, right? It's pointers that are parent and child. And we call this structure a tree, right? Mm. There's relationships, <laughs> but you can have other pointers in there like uh even attributes are similar they're also nodes they're attribute nodes and text is also nodes and mm -hmm. but they're not element parent and children and so the thinking was like well would we make a different connector in there that's just called a shadow root and it's like because css everything in css is based on selecting via this parent and child concept descendants ancestors that will just not go through and affect the stuff inside. And so it's fine. And, um, but could you, if you wanted to cross the boundary, Google said, sure, why not? We're all amongst friends. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, Apple said none shall pass. That's what we need. You know, we need 
Gandalf, the Gandalf mode. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so we added that. They, that became the open shadow root and the closed shadow root. And the one that he said was most important to him was sort of like the one that browsers do. Like you want to make sure that um, nobody can build dependencies based on your insides so that we can make sure that when they update, like when I update, they don't break. So that's the use cases that uh, that the Shadow DOM was built around. Yeah, which is an interesting use case. Uh, it is an interesting not what a lot case. of people are doing. What are people doing, if that's not what a lot of people are doing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a real mix. Um, there's... And I I can't claim to be an expert on all things web components or custom elements. I mean, I feel also like Eric's blog posts uh, are part of what made me take a deeper look and play around with it now quite a bit, but recently and learning from the people who have been doing it longer. But it seems to me that there's a mix and there's a lot of us coming in from the outside that are expecting something a little more like... uh, components that we're used to in not just JavaScript frameworks, but even, I mean, when I think back to uh, early days of writing PHP includes, that sort Mm -hmm. of, I, I expect there to be a template that I'm reusing across the page and I'm using it as part of a component library or design system. And it's less about, uh, I mean, maybe I'm putting some things in there that I don't want to get out but I'm not really trying to isolate it from the page otherwise. Uh, It's part of the page. It's part of my design system. It's just a reusable template in my toolkit. Um, So I don't need all of that isolation from it. Uh, I think a lot of us are coming at it from that perspective, uh, which is pretty different from providing primitives like the browser does. Mm, Okay. Uh, I think what Mia said is totally accurate. I think that the real thing that Shadow Dom wants to solve is more a cooperation thing. It's not a, like, we're on opposing <laughs> sides of a military here, right? We're on the same side frequently. And the trouble is, it's still too easy to have friendly fire, right? Like, we can right. accidentally hurt one another. And mm. what we need is some model for cooperation. And I think that the Shadow Dom in its current state is sort of, not that, right? Right. And I've been thinking a little bit about this. Um, Like when I use a tool, uh, rarely, like Bootstrap, um, (laughs) there is, uh, on one side, there is the tool. And on the other side, it's very clear, I am the one using it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so there's sort of a, the direction of flow is one way and clear. I'm not Mm -hmm. pushing anything back into Bootstrap. I'm just importing it into my page and then doing what I want. Um, And there's some amount of that with a web component, right? I can pull it into my page and uh, it it has become part of my page and I should be able to do what I want. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if I'm able to reach into it that's a little bit of a different thing than what I'm doing with Bootstrap. What does it mean for me to reach into a web component as the page author and do something to what's inside? There's sort of a two-way flow. Yeah. Like you can think about something like a video element is a nice one because we all know like what, you know, we put a video tag in your in your HTML and it can be just a, a tag with the source. And then suddenly there's like the actual canvas that the video renders on. And there's like a whole bunch of buttons. There's a scrub bar, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. And if you inspect, you can see that in, in a shadow Dom. And so, you know, if you are in the outer document and you say document query selector, all button, you need a way to say, those are not your buttons, right? (laughs) You don't want to accidentally select those buttons, right? Um, right. But 
but the question is like, should you be able to select those buttons and should you be able to in CSS style those buttons? I don't think those are even the same question, right? Well, and who, and who gets to make that decision? Is it, is it the person writing the component who may want to not reveal their internals in a way uh, that makes you reliant on them? Or is it you as the person pulling it into your page? Yeah. Who gets to make that call? There's a lot of care taken to make sure that you can close the shadow DOM and then it would like literally be impossible for it to leak any secret out into the page, uh, which puts it, you think, squarely in the hands of component authors, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. sure what it sounds like. Except that the page author can override the prototype with like three lines of code and say, no, there's no such thing as closed shadow DOM. Whatever well, you say like closed, a... I interpret it as open. Is this like those little stickers that like if you cut the sticker, now you've voided the warranty? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, that's a that's a good point, but I don't think that it holds up because... Like if you designed things to work that way, like that, that's the idea, right? With, uh, with your browser default elements, not your browser default, your browser native elements mm -hmm. is that you shouldn't be able to say query selector in and get their button. Like they say, no, you can't. That's a secret. Um, and if somehow you manage to like, would a browser just be able to like, oh, sorry, you shouldn't have done that. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> because <laughs> if that gets deployed, any important thing that has, you know, people depend on it, then, well, I mean, we can't go breaking things. Yeah. But that's different, though, than websites, right? Because websites, you do update libraries yourself, right? Like you say, well. Right. I'm going to get a new version of Bootstrap and then you get it and you see that it doesn't work and you go, well, I should not deploy that. Right. You're saying as a page author, uh, you don't get to decide when you upgrade browsers, the people coming to your website decide when they upgrade the browser. But yeah, right. When you update a, a web component, you make that call. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That is a big difference. I think that's huge. Um, so, you know, this has been a big debate for a long time. And a couple of years ago, there was this issue that was open and it was called open stylable. Uh, I think it was Justin who opened it from mm -hmm. Google. I could be wrong about that, but, um, I was talking to tab Adkins on the bus in Spain, actually. Uh, we had the CSS working group there and I was saying like, we need to open an issue for this. And he said, I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> we need to open an issue for this. Uh, one of my examples was uh, I have a markdown element, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you put markdown in and it can give you like the preview, you know, uh, of the HTML as it will be rendered. This is a really, really common thing. And that's not a secret, right? That's a shorthand. Right. That's a completely different use case, a shorthand, right? Right. It's not a secret at all. And it's just really well, handy to illustrate exactly the kind of thing that you're saying. And I think even, even when I look at browser components, I can see a difference there, right? Like you were talking about the video element and it has some buttons inside of it if you turn on the controls. And those aren't normal buttons. Those are special video buttons. They've got a special design. They don't look like buttons. They've got mm -hmm. their own look, their own thing that they do. They're special. Um, and you don't want to, you write a button style. You don't want it to apply to the video buttons. That wouldn't make sense. That would break your page. But then they've got a file input and it gives you this button. And now here's a button that looks like a default button. Uh, it's got, you know, the button for uploading a file and then the text next to it that says what file you've selected. Uh, and that one 
it in every other way looks like a default button. But now it's weird that you can't easily access it and style it along with all of your other buttons, right? Like those are really different situations even coming from the browser. And I think we have those again with people building custom elements and using Shadow DOM. Like some yeah. buttons are buttons and some buttons are something special. Even though there's something special, when you say you wouldn't want to, I say, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> well, you, I think you, <laughs> I don't know you. That's true. I think I wouldn't want to by default, right? I would want to say something specific if I'm going to grab the yeah. buttons on a control for a video. I'm going to want to do that explicitly. Yeah. But I'm going to, with the file upload, it feels weird that it doesn't happen implicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Justin opened this issue and it turned out that what Justin opened was not like my shorthand case. It was like completely different case. Mm -hmm. And then I believe it was Greg Whitworth who was coming from maybe Salesforce at the time. He's at Salesforce now. I'm not sure if he was then, but uh, he said, Oh, I also have need for this. And then when he described it, it was like also neither what Justin was saying or what I was saying. <laughs> but right. all of us described it as open, styleable. And that is, you know, like the, basically this is just some way to style a web component from the outside. And it sounds really straightforward on the one hand, like, sure. But there are three things before the issue was even open that all wanted something <laughs> actually totally different. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we were talking about this and also there's this, uh, there's this new thing that uh, was happening at the time, uh, scoped CSS. And um, it was determined way back to like not do scope CSS because we need sort of one primitive that explains encapsulation of style. Right. Let's not, let's not invent two at the same time, you know, cause it's hard enough mm -hmm. to get one. So we just took it off the table, but now uh, that's coming back and we're getting some kind of like even donut scopey thing. Could you tell yeah. us about that a little bit? Sure. Um, and I wasn't uh, paying close attention to web standards the first round. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of research on what it did the last time because uh, I helped design the new one. Um, but uh, the, the new feature is entirely CSS-based. Uh, it's sort of a totally different mental model from... Uh, either Shadow DOM or some of how the old feature worked. Uh, the idea is entirely that a style can decide for itself or a selector can decide for itself that it should uh, only match within a certain segment of the DOM. But that's also done by selectors. So you've got selectors for every part of this. And that's different from Shadow DOM where it's not determined by a selector, it's determined by the element in the DOM, right? Mm -hmm. So the the one is a DOM out approach to encapsulation. And this is not really encapsulation, it's more like uh, just limiting selectors in a bit more of a specific way. So you can say, uh, find uh, find a scope that goes from this outer selector, it's called, um, it's a class of outer scope, and uh, take anything inside of, if you find an outer scope class, an element that matches that, take all of its descendants until you find these other selectors that are lower boundaries, uh, and only match within that donut. So it's a donut because, it's all of the descendants until something. So you can have a, a 
content class inside of it. So you say from outer scope to content, only match within that. And we're not matching anything inside of the content. We're just matching between the two. Um, and then we can have a third selector. I mean, it's a little it's a little funny. It takes three selectors to do this. You say, what is the outer range of the scope? What is the inner boundary of the scope? And then within that, what things do I want to select? So it's a way of defining ownership. I think this is something people have used uh, conventions like BEM, block element modifier, to do this in the past, to right. say, I don't just want to select title, I want to select the post title. And that's not exactly the same as every title in a post. It might be that I have comment titles that are in a post or something. They don't belong to the post. Uh, they're just inside of it. And so Donut Scope allows us to do that, to say things that actually belong to this component and not to things that I've put inside of this component. Did I explain that in a way that makes sense? Yeah. And also now I want donuts. I was going to ah, say, can we, can we splice in a, a Homer Simpson going, mm, donuts? Mm, donuts. <laughs> uh, um, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, you, had me at, you had me at donut. Yeah, um, big time. Yeah, great. It, it's interesting to me that after that initial email that you mentioned, uh, pointing out how many different types of encapsulation there are, that even after that, the group resolved that we should have only one. There can be only one. That seems like a weird choice to me. Like, if there are multiple different types of encapsulation we want to talk about, so, shouldn't we have different approaches to the different types of encapsulation? So the answer is yes, but I think the fact that we didn't is just due to the fact that if you make it too complicated, we'll never get it done. <laughs> but I, I do have some regrets that we didn't find a way to talk about this cooperation more. There used to be. Uh, so Tab brought to the CSS working group one day okay, so we have these open shadow roots and, you know, you can't cross the boundary, but you can, like you can walk across the boundary. You can say, get the element and then say it's dot shadow root. <laughs> and then you have the subtree and you can do whatever you want in there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why not have a selector for that? Like, it's just, it's a different connector, but doesn't mean CSS couldn't understand it. And then you could have the sort of like, Hey, I know what I'm doing, you know? And then right. that becomes like you said, Mia, which is like, sorry, you cut the little tag off the mattress. So the warranty is void. <laughs> um, uh, and that passed without any controversy. It was like, of course you need that. Why should, of course you should have that. And they went by a number of names, but basically they were just, you know, shadow root combinator. And there was a deep combinator too. Like, do you want to cross every shadow root or just the, the nearest one? And like that year at W3C TPAC, there was a web components breakout and they said, yeah, we shouldn't do that. And even the people that we gave it to, they were like, once we had it, we were like, oh yeah, this is... We have no feet left. We have like foot gunned our feet away. Um, we regret, we have regrets ever asking for this. We're not going to use it ever. So yeah, I mean, that was the extent of the cooperation, but I, I mean, I do think that this is tricky though, right? Because. Oh, for sure. If you think about programming languages, you have, you have like private, it's like nobody mm -hmm. can use this, but mm -hmm. me, and you have public, which is like anybody can use this. But you also have something like friendly or protected or something that's like, if I want to let you access it, you can kind of access it too. And you are just, it's up to you to invent something like that. So like without inventing a way to share secrets or whatever, they, they can't, you know? Right. I mean, this is, this is why I keep thinking of it as a cascade issue 
Uh, I mean, when we're talking specifically about styles, because this is what the cascade is designed for. It's designed for a collaboration across different needs and desires, right? So it starts with origins. The browser provides some styles, uh, base styles that make the thing readable. And then um, user preferences uh, can update those defaults, again, sort of globally, potentially, or maybe you could try to target a specific site. And then author styles sort of by default override everybody unless people have used bang important and then they take the power back uh and the browser styles you if you look at the browser styles you can see they do use bang important several places it's a way of saying you're not allowed to change this thing uh and in user preferences you can do the same thing you can you can just change your default font size but you can also say uh enforce this and uh, depending on the browser um, it will enforce it and it's the same as putting bang important on it so we already this is css is designed around this idea of collaboration so when i look at this problem i think oh we're in a similar situation and there's a little bit of it built in right where the uh by default shadow styles go first, they act like browser defaults, basically. And then if you can access the same components, which are the same elements, if you can style the same elements from the outside, which is true on the host element, and sometimes true on parts that have been exposed, uh, then the page wins unless things are marked as important. And when things are marked as important, uh, the component wins again. So there's, again, there's been some attempt to do this from that perspective. Uh, but now I think the question is, could we open it up more? And if we do, how do we allow you to style more things and collaborate even more on the layering between them? No, you're right that it is, um, that it is, about like, okay, how would we open it up? Assuming that we want to open it up. Maybe even before we say whether we should open it up, like you like the donut styles thing, like it doesn't address all those use cases either. You would agree, right? Like right. You, you can't make like composite things with that. You it doesn't affect JavaScript, you know? No. Um it's very specifically uh just it's a it's a selector utility. It's helping you select more, more exactly what you're trying to select. And that's all it is. It doesn't keep other things from getting in. Uh, it doesn't keep um, inheritance from getting out. Uh, mm -hmm. There's sort of nothing besides. All it does is let you select exactly what you want to select in a more specific way yeah. uh, that we weren't able to describe before. It's a it's a selector. I think we're really handy for those like those many many. I mean, I think it's an incredible amount of times when you could just use the light DOM approach, mm -hmm. and you know because it's it's you or it's you and your coworkers, and you know it's like the use cases are fairly straightforward. I think that would be great for a lot of those where they just want to say. Right. We're not, there's no shadow DOM involved here. We just need to like manage the complexity and select these things yeah. in an intelligible way. Yeah. And it does have a, a utility for that. You can, um, instead of giving it an explicit scope root, you can put it inside of a style element inside of the DOM. And then it uses the parent of that style element as the scope root. So that's a little bit like, shadow dom styles without being shadow dom styles right it it uh it just assumes that the host is the root yeah. and you're styling things inside of it so it does have that ability as well that's like kind of what the old model was right if i recall uh, yeah the old model was just sort of that and not any of the other stuff right I think um, that's right so yeah okay so now 
like assume that we want to open it up and say, okay, lots of people seem to be asking for something, not all the same thing. <laughs> and also, how do we balance it so that we try to make it unlikely that we implement a thing and we give it to a bunch of people and then they have buyer's remorse like the people who <laughs> we gave the other thing to? Because once you let that genie out of the bottle on the web, you know. Yeah. It also seems to me that you can make all these dreams more or less possible with some JavaScript because, you know, like I said, you're the page author. You can like override prototypes and stuff. Like you can say, when you attach a shadow root, I would like you to cooperate with the page and coordinate your style sheet situation. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, okay, but now what does it do? And so I, I made this little library and it had four different modes. Eric really helped me come up with like some kind of names for these because there's everything is so complicated to name unless you're Mia because Mia names everything. Bruce? Bruce. Yeah, I think right. you can just call things Bruce. Yes, all yeah. things are just called Bruce. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Simplifies. It, it does. It simplifies a lot of things. And it's really clear because it's easy to spell. It's short, right? Yeah. So one, one mode is actually, there already existed a library from Nolan Lawson, who's at Salesforce now. And it's been out there for like a year or so. And it's the solution is uh, when you say like my class extends HTML element, instead of saying that you say extends open style will element. So the, the proposal would be to add a new class that you could extend. And if you extend that class, that's your way of signaling as an, as a component author, I would like to uh, pull down all the page styles. Um, does that, is that clear or do you get the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I had developed a similar solution to that, like before I came to Agalia and the only kind of tweak was that I didn't want to pull down all of the styles. I wanted to say specifically from the outer page, these are the styles that can be pulled down. So we call this component pull mode and component pull marked mode. So marked would just get the ones that you marked with a special attribute. And after a little while, I thought that like is challenging because you can get your custom elements from anywhere, right? Like Mia was saying, like bootstrap, like surely there will be libraries of custom elements or one-offs. Uh, Dave Rupert has the awesome standalones. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Maybe there's another custom element somewhere else that you pick up. And the trouble is right. that, well, they're not going to probably agree on on the classes. So as a page author, it's really limiting if I want to try that. So I came up with this alternative model that goes the other way, where the page just finds all the shadow roots and says, Sorry, you weren't designed for this, but I'm going to push this down anyway. Um, <laughs> and uh, that just also has two variants. That was uh, page push that push everything and page push marked that would just push the styles that have an extra attribute that say this one. And I published that and then Mia opened an issue on that. And Mia said, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and came up with another one, right? And uh, can you describe the other one? Do you even remember? Because I've moved um, on from it. Yeah, yeah, I've moved on from it as well. Uh, so I don't quite remember what it was. It was some combination of things, right? It was... Um... Oh, it was, it was, I want to be able to say on individual element as the author, like I want to be able to say like, yeah, I want to add an attribute that says like, right i'm willing to accept yeah yeah but not as the component author as the page author right Right. yeah, yeah. so wow those are and then that has the same two variants so now we're up to six possible modes right. um, <laughs> and then so i published that and um and about that time chris coyer published a thing and said but can't i just use css <laughs> and dave rupert <laughs> 
published a thing that was a kind of a feedback and he said can i just use css and when i was making these i also ran into the case where i wanted to make a code pen mm-hmm. and uh me and i brainstormed a whole bunch and could not come up with a way even with chris Coyer's help <laughs> to create a code pen for the old way because it relied on you adding attributes to the html element and you can't do that in code pen so I very quickly ran into limits and frustrations with that myself. And we we came up with this hack that, how, how would you describe this, Mia? Like it, well, it, it uses media queries uh, or the idea of custom media queries. But instead of really querying anything, well, I mean, it, you're sort of, you're almost doing a container query, really. Um, but you use app media. And I think we're just grabbing that because it works, right? The proposal isn't, uh, this is the right syntax, but we probably need some sort of at rule to wrap things. And at media is one that we have. And we can say uh, at media across the light DOM and the shadow DOM apply these styles or at media just in the shadow DOM of these elements or just in the light DOM. Um, we can sort of use media queries to say we're only targeting some or all of those different locations with these styles. Yeah, I think that's a probably good, you know, like parallel. But we're just using the at media because the parser doesn't throw it away. If you don't know, um, the CSSOM, there's a lot you can put in CSS that just won't appear in the CSSOM which means that if you want to use something like that that gets thrown away by the parser, you have to fetch the thing again, which will have problems if with cross-origin issues. You have to get at the text, and you have to parse CSS. Like, you have to reparse CSS. So we're just sort of um, subverting. We're, we're using the, the fact that media queries are very flexible and don't throw much away. <laughs> If you stay within some very basic rules, it will work. And then you can just use the CSSOM. So it lets us keep the size of the library to like, it's like literally a hundred lines, I think not even a hundred lines. Yeah. It's really, it's a really interesting solution. And, uh, the thing that I keep coming back to is it maybe needs a coordination layer as well, or there's, there's some way that this relates to layering. Uh, I agree. And this solution doesn't get to that. Uh, So how do I say, as a component author, here are the layers that I'm providing, and here's how you can slot in below, above, or between them. And I can decide not to provide layers you can go between, or uh, maybe I don't even let you go above or below. I only let you go to one of those. but is there some way as a component author, I can say, here are the layers internally, and here's how you're allowed to interact with them. And then is there some way as a page author that I can say, I want to provide some defaults. Uh, I want my reset to come before, I want it to apply to these components before the component styles. Um, And I also have some things I want to do to override component styles. So I want to slot those in at different layers. How do you how do you coordinate that between the component author and the page author? That's a great question. I have no ideas. <laughs> if you or anybody <laughs> has ideas, please please submit them. Yeah, I mean these are all really hard questions, right? I mean, you know, we're grappling with it here just in this conversation, you know, the and these these questions of you know, when can things be overridden and by whom and in what ways? And mm-hmm. it's, it's really, it's really challenging in the context of the web. Yeah. Right. Cause the answer is very much, it depends, right? That's the answer to all web questions is it depends, but yes, once again, it depends. But that's, that's why we provide uh, things like the cascade that give us sort of hooks into those decisions, right? Mm. Like it's the reason importance exists is so that we can decide that while generally the author of the page gets priority in the final word, they don't uh, because other people can mark things as important and take back that control. 
So is there a way that we can do that again? Um, provide some hook into an algorithm that says, by default, we think it should go this way, but we're giving you an option to change it around. Hmm. Yeah, more ideas and feedback. I, I am really, really keen on not lingering too long on the speculation and theory and giving people something that's like, even if it's not the thing, it's like kind of close enough to the thing that you can evaluate whether that idea is useful. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So I feel like I, you know, I provided four that I could think of very quickly. We got this other feedback and then very quickly we got this other feedback. And I, I think, I think I feel like sort of night and day to me, I don't think there's any competition. I like the most recent thing better. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's likely to happen unless we can, you know, give people stuff and say, here's a, here's a code pen, go play with it. Um, but now I think also we need like help evaluating it. And I don't know, how do you think we get developers more engaged in that kind of thing? Because like Oof. I had this idea on this one to share a single GitHub issue and say, leave an emoji. How do you feel about this? If you want to put other comments, you can do that. If you want to open other issues, you can do that. But like, just give me an idea of your sentiment of this. How, like what do you, what do you think is a good way to increase engagement with developers in terms of yeah i don't i mean i i think we run into this all the time with standards i mean it it seems hard to me because with anything like this we've got people who are fine with it the way it is um mm -hmm. and use it quite a bit so would be ideal testers but they don't need something new it works Right, um, and we've got people who aren't using the thing because it doesn't work the way that they want, and so they maybe don't even know exactly what to test because they haven't played with it. Yeah, and then there's people who are sort of playing with it, but if it's not my day job, uh, if nobody's paying me to go try the new thing, when when am I supposed to do that? On whose budget? Yeah, uh, that's huge, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we can get maybe some, here's a code pen and, you know, just spend five, ten minutes with it sometime when you have five, ten minutes. But that's a different, that's a whole different thing than, you know, the kind of real feedback that would ultimately be the most helpful, which is like, go try this at your project at work, you know, and trick is like, not everybody has this use case or this need or this situation right now. So Right. And there are still several different use cases and needs floating around, like you mentioned at the beginning. Um, like, definitely, I've found that sometimes talking about it on social media, we're just talking about different use cases, different people disagreeing with each other, not because one idea actually solves the problem and the other doesn't, but because they're solving different problems. Yeah. What's the law, the best way to get the right answer on the internet? It's Cunningham's law. Yeah. Best way to get the right answer to a question is to post the incorrect answer. So right. sort of the classic one is you post a picture of a of a duck and say, like, this is a this is a really attractive goose. And then you'll have like six people telling you, that is a female mallard duck. Right. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh so I don't know. We're not I guess we're not gonna solve this here or probably but also, I should say that I just misspoke. It's actually Cunningham's law, and I almost left it in to get a bunch of people to reply. But <laughs> I think you should just leave it in just to see who replies. We could do that. It's full of interesting problems, and um, I hope that we can continue to work on them together. Mia, if you have ideas for the layer stuff, I'm I'm definitely all ears for that. I just have no idea how we can do that effectively that's a good question actually do you know the answer about like you should know the answer i guess because you invented it sort of um but like if you have a shadow root are layers global or are they no like... uh, layers are contained to the shadow root so i mean i think one approach here so named layers i mean specifically like 
Right. Layer names are scoped to the shadow root, so they don't cross the boundary, so there's no potential for accidental conflicts there. Right. So then the question is, can we make, can we provide a way to have intentional crossover between layers? I think that might be interesting, and I don't, I haven't thought through exactly what a syntax for that would look like, or, I mean, it's, I think this goes back to the thing I was saying before of like, we designed layers so that they would clearly work for the bootstrap case. Bootstrap can provide layers and you can consume those layers uh, and interact with them uh, in ways that bootstrap has exposed. Um, right. So the one tool can decide to expose some layers and then the page author can decide to interact with them or not. Um, and the question here would be, who's exposing which layers? Is it that the page exposes some layers that the component author can pull in? I mean, that's, this is sort of the component pull versus page push in right. your uh, first model. Um, is it like the page, the page provides some things and the component author is allowed to pull them in? Or is it like the component provides an interface for layers where you're allowed to push into. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't dug into all of that, but I think that's the that's the question that is bugging me right now. Yeah, me too. Mm. With with that note, uh, thank you, Miriam, for coming online. Where can people find you on the intertubes? Uh, they can find me on. Mastodon, uh, Mia at Front End Social, or uh, they can go to the Oddbird website. Oddbird is uh, the web agency that I co-founded. We uh, do a lot of work in various areas of the web. So uh, oddbird.net. Cool. And that's, yeah, I assume you're uh, open for new clients? We are open for new clients and we do okay. all sorts of things from refactors to custom built applications. Right. Very cool. All right. So thank you so much. And uh, hopefully in, you know, after some period of time, we'll be able to do this again with an update on what has been learned and figured out. Yeah. Hopefully uh, you'll figure it out and let us know. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam.